And so today we are rounding the corner, final week of Mind Your Business. And if you're taking notes, which we've already established, note takers get into heaven first. It's like a fast pass into eternity. We are going to be looking at Exodus 20 and Matthew 11. Someone say, got it. Then we need to talk about clarity over here. Because clarity breeds clarity. Someone say that. Say clarity breeds clarity. The more clarity you have, the more clarifying other things become. And there are three things that we will need to kind of keep in mind about clarity as we jump into today's conversation. Then there's something Jesus tells us uh, that also gives us three verbs to look at, uh, which I think are important for all, us to always pay attention. You open up the pages of scripture, uh, pay attention to the verbs. I would say a very practical and easy way to extract uh, practical application uh, from scripture is to highlight the verbs. Those are the action steps. And sometimes you can find a lot of insight in just saying, hey, what are the verbs and the actions being taken in this passage? And so we're gonna look at that. And then uh, maybe if we have some time, we should talk about dancing. Anyone like dancing? Anyone wish you could dance? And then we will talk about running, dancing and running. Anyone hate both of those? Maybe. All right, so here's where we're at. Clarity breeds clarity. And this is something that uh, many organizations will even have a conversation about this. Clarity, it breeds clarity. The more clarity you have, uh, the more clarifying other things become. And I will often find myself in conversations specifically with younger leaders who are uh, beginning their career. They just got a new job. They entered into a new company or organization. And one of the things you'll hear them say is, I, I'm just lacking clarity around my role and, and I'm lacking clarity around the expectations or I'm lacking clarity around the objective and the, the end goal. And I will say that clarity is key. We say on our team, to be unclear is to be unkind. And I think we stole that from someone else, but it, it is a great principle. To be unclear is to be unkind. But I will say uh, to younger leaders in terms of the clarity conversation, be careful what you wish for. Anyone ever heard that? Hey, just be careful what you wish for. Because here's what happens when you have clarity. When you have clarity, one, you can tell who is meeting the expectations. Right, so once there's clear standards, expectations, guidelines, deadlines, suddenly you can tell, oh, I can tell who's meeting the expectations and who's not. In addition to that, you can tell who's exceeding the expectations. The person going the extra mile, the, the person who's doing the lion's share of the work. And lastly, you can see who is cheating the expectations. And I say that because what we're gonna look at today is going to be very clarifying for all of us. And what that will do is it will expose the reality for every single one of us. Are we meeting the expectations? Are we exceeding the expectations? Or are we cheating the expectations? And here's something that if you're new to the Bible, you are sure to find this annoying if you start to read God's word. In God's word, one thing that I find to be annoying is God tends to be the clearest in the areas we find to be the hardest. You know what I find that annoying? It's like, I get it. You don't have to keep emphasizing the point. But God does this. He tends to be the clearest in the areas you and I find to be the hardest. This is why he talks so much about forgiveness because bitterness is still at the root of our heart in many times. This is why he talks about generosity because greed is a real thing. And what we're gonna talk about today is something that you will see from cover to cover uh, throughout scripture. Now, if you're not a Christian, you're new to church, uh, to give you an on-ramp so you can participate in today's conversation. The Bible is not a book. The Bible is a library of 66 books. It is the most impressive collection of ancient documents and literature in human history. Even atheists would agree to that, that no other work of literature can make the claims that the Bible can. The, the time that it spans, it was written in three different languages on three different continents, 66 books. It is an impressive work. So many different authors somehow all telling the same story. It's, it's marvelous. And the Bible begins uh, with the book of Genesis. God shows up on the scene. He creates his wonderful, perfect creation. And then 
uh, you know, humanity messes it up and we open the door for sin to enter in. There's what would be known as the fall of man. And what does God do when humanity comes up short? What does God do when humanity lets sin in the door and fractures his creation? He immediately responds with redemption. He immediately responds with, hey, I'm gonna rescue them and I'm gonna set this right and I'm going to redeem them. Anyone thankful for a God whose impulse is redemption, whose instinct is to extend grace and forgiveness? And so what you find throughout history and throughout the pages of scripture is you find God's redemptive plan unfolding, okay? And so how does God do it? He does it incrementally. He doesn't cut corners. He takes his time and he does it right. And he raises up a man that raises up a family that raises up a tribe that then becomes a nation. Okay, you tracking with me? And what's the name of that nation? Israel. And Israel has this super inconsistent journey, which take heart. Uh, If you look at the story of Israel, you'll find how good God was to them despite their inconsistencies. And you'll find that God is going to be just as good to you despite your inconsistencies. The nation of Israel, they they ebb and they flow. They're they're up and they're down. It's topsy-turvy. There's a lot of detours and they are missing the mark at times. Sometimes they're doing well. Sometimes they're struggling. There comes a point where the nation of Israel finds himself in captivity in Egypt. And for how long? 400 years. Right? They're in slavery. They are being ruled over by a man by, uh, that goes by the title Pharaoh who also thought of himself as a god and a deity. Right, He thought he should be worshiped and adored. And so they are in slavery for 400 years. And then God raises up a Moses and God sends in a Moses to liberate his people. Now track with me because this will serve you well. When Moses shows up, He has this like 10 round boxing match with Pharaoh where they square off. God's sending in plagues and ultimately God parts the Red Sea and the nation of Israel march out of Egypt, out of slavery and into the wilderness. And it becomes very apparent almost immediately that these people don't know how to live free lives. Right, the the generation coming out of slavery only knew slavery. 400 years, this group of people, they were born in Egypt. It's all they knew. And have you ever thought about the idea that a fish doesn't discover water until it's out of it? Sometimes we are so immersed in dysfunction and toxic environments that we don't even understand the dynamics that are shaping us and informing our instincts and shaping our mindsets until we're out of it and we realize, whoa, What was that? I mean, many of you have had this experience. You gave your life to Christ. You turned around and pivoted, right? And you realize, oh my goodness, what was that? I may not be where I want to be, but by the grace of God, I'm not where I used to be or could be, right? So it is what it is, but it ain't what it ain't. I, I am moving in the right direction and I'm realizing that I was in a life of bondage for so long and I didn't even know it. The nation of Israel is led out into the wilderness and God realizes, okay, they need to learn how to live free lives. Scripture would say it this way. It would say, it is for freedom that you were set free. It sounds like a double negative, right? Like why say it twice? It is for freedom that you were set free because what scripture is saying is once we are freed from our sins and we we have this pardon from Christ, the temptation in our faulty nature is to revert back to former bondage. And scripture say, no, you have to learn to live a free life. So how does God do it? He brings Moses up the mountain. And what does Moses come down with? The 10 commandments. Yeah. Some of you just got a Bible star for your homework, right? And Moses comes down with the 10 commandments, Exodus chapter 20. And watch what God says in verse two. He says, I am the Lord, your God, right? So he's establishing leadership. He is distinguishing, you know, hey, you're used to Pharaoh. Now it is me who is reigning over your life. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So what you find is God is going to begin implementing his principles, his standards, the way in which he wants his people to operate. And he wants them to know, hey, you are only used 
or accustomed to one kind of leadership. And I am a very different leader than what you were experiencing in Egypt. In fact, I am a different God. Pharaoh thought he was a God, but he was a puny idol. In fact, anything claiming to be a God is only a puny idol because there is only one true God. That's what scripture would claim and this is what God stands on. And he says, I have brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. My desire, God is saying, is for you to experience a free life and to get the most out of the life Jesus died to give you. Okay, how do we do it, God? And he goes into the 10 commandments. And the fourth commandment, like if you see Moses coming down the mountain and he's lugging these like big old slate tablets and you're like, oh my goodness, this is going to be brilliant. God told Moses something and it's gonna be earth shattering. Here comes some theory that is going to blow our minds. And God says some pretty basic things. And in verse eight, he says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Someone say all your work. Six days you should do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on it, you shall not do any work. And it's amazing because God comes out and in his top 10, in fact, you could say his top five, he says, hey, one of the best things, most holy, wisest things you could do is take a day off. Right? For some of you, the most spiritual thing you could do today is go home and take a nap. Like you read this and you're like, that's what you've got? And God's like, yeah. Think about how hard it is for people to actually get a day off. And again, scripture is the clearest in the areas we find to be the hardest. And God is constantly clarifying our need for margin, our need for like sustainable rhythms in our life. And this is something that when you go through the page of scripture, you're gonna realize I'm either meeting the expectations, I'm exceeding the expectations, or I'm cheating the expectations. And this is something that uh, is obviously referenced in the 10 commandments, honor the Sabbath. But where do we first see the Sabbath? In the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, God creates for six days. And then on the seventh day, he, he rests, yeah. And what that tells us is not that God uh, is exhaustible, not that you can exhaust his strength and at some point he has to recuperate. No, it tells us he's a good God and he understands his children. And so he establishes day one as a good leader, a standard in which you and I can replicate. Because if he would have came out and established a standard only he could replicate, you and I would drown under the standard. So he establishes this rhythm. And all throughout scripture, you find uh, this issue of margin uh, being referenced over and over again. There comes a point where God has given instruction uh, to people in terms of agriculture and raising crops. And this is what he says. He says, when you harvest your field, come on, wave at me if you're a farmer, right? This is gonna build some relational equity between us. He says, as you are harvesting your field, don't harvest the entire thing. Always leave some crops around the edges. Why do that? Because there's foreigners and widows and homeless people and impoverished individuals in our community who do not have a field to harvest of their own. You should leave some on the edges as margin uh, to help them out and to be a blessing to others. And, and you see this all throughout scripture, this idea of live with space so God can use you to be a blessing to others. Live with space so you can live a more fulfilling and meaningful life. And who modeled this best? Jesus. In fact, Jesus modeled it so well, it stresses me out. Like, have you ever looked at Jesus' approach to life and you got stressed out? Jesus had uh, such a demand on his life. I, I know we think we have a demand. I, I know when we start talking about margin and taking a day off and having good boundaries and disciplines and productive rhythms in your career, I think it's easy for all of us to say, well, you have no idea. Uh, the kids I'm raising, the job I'm working, and the woman I'm married to. Those three things maximize my time. Can I get an amen? 
right? You, you can go down the list of, hey, this job is taxing and this woman makes sure that if I'm going up the stairs, I am taking anything that belongs upstairs with me. She's gonna maximize my trip upstairs. Anyone else you're married to that spouse was like, hey, if you're on your way, you might as well take these 17 boxes with you. And, and then you have kids who come home from school after spending eight hours in a school all day. These teachers think it's wise to send them home with two hours worth of homework. And no judgment to your teachers, but it's an undertaking. And then you have sports and you've got all this other stuff. And don't you feel like, man, my time is maxed out. It's hard to live with margin. You have no idea the demands that are on me. Well, that argument, my argument, our excuses, they evaporate immediately the moment you read the gospels. Because Jesus shows up on the scene and day one, from the very first breath he breathed, the weight of the world rested upon his shoulders. Eternity hung in the balance with every step he took, every decision he made, every interaction he had, every dinner he went to, every boat ride he jumped on, everything he did, eternity hung in the balance for you and for me and for all of humanity. Jesus had some things going on. Jesus had some pressure. Jesus dealt with some demands. Jesus had an important purposeful life. Yet somehow, he managed to live with extreme spontaneity and margin. And sometimes I'll read the pages of scripture. I'm like, Jesus, what are you doing? You're here to save the world. You think it's wise to just be running around having all these one-on-one -on -one interactions. You're gonna go talk to the woman at the well and this woman touched the hem of, your, hem of your garment. So you're gonna talk to her and then you're gonna go bless this wedding with an obscene amount of wine. What are we doing here? This seems like a bad plan to save the world. You know, when you look at Jesus' approach, it's like this uh, doesn't fit the confines of our organizational leadership model. We should have some systems in place. We should be able to scale this. And why did you come now? You should have waited for social media. We would have been able to get the word out a lot quicker. But Jesus, he, he just did. He, he operated at his own pace. He played to his own rhythm. And the entire time he's inviting us, hey, you should give it a shot. Hey, hey you you should give it a shot. It makes me think my daughter, Riley, uh, early on, Riley really took the dance and she was great at it. Still to this day, she's a good dancer. And around the age of six or seven, uh, she decided to quit dancing. And I was bummed about it. I loved the whole dance thing as a dad. I'm sentimental. I like the little outfits. I like the recitals. I like showing up with the biggest bouquet of flowers. I am so extra because that space permits it. And... Riley decides, hey, I'm, I don't want to dance anymore. And Krista and I asked her, like, well, why don't you want to dance? You're so good at it. And she says, I love dancing. I just don't like being told how to dance. I just want the music to move me. Which is what a white person says when it comes to dancing. It's like, <laughs> I don't want to take your instructions. Just let me fill out the beat, right? And it's funny, Kristen looks at me as if I was supposed to be the one to win the argument. And I said, I can't argue with the logic, right? Uh, I don't like being told how to dance. I just want the music to move me. And I, I think of that because that's so much what you get from Jesus. He, he shows up and there's these demands and we are, ourselves place a demand on Christ. This is how a fruitful, effective, and life-giving journey uh, in life should look like. And he's like, no. Like, I'm going to dance to my own rhythm, and I am going to approach this radically different, and you should consider doing it as well. I think the idea around margin is critical if you are going to finish well in the faith, if you are gonna build healthy marriages, raise solid kids, if you are going to steward and manage a long, fruitful career, uh, understanding the importance of margin is critical. And what is margin? Margin is the space between your load and your limits. Margin is the space between your load and your limits. And humanity comes with limits. Have you ever discovered that? You know, the whole idea, hey, you can be whatever you wanna be. No, you can't. You actually can't. Like, some of you will not make the NBA. <laughs> like, you cannot just be whatever you wanna be. We all have limitations. And where do limitations come into play? Before or after sin enters the world? Before, 
right? They're in the garden, perfect world. And God says, you shall not eat of this tree. That's a limit. And what you have to understand, Exodus 20, the 10 commandments, things that you see in scripture all throughout is God's boundaries for your life are God's blessings for your life. God's not trying to be some cosmic killjoy out to control you, but God puts principles and rules and standards and commands in place also that you can get the most out of this life. Rules make a game enjoyable. I'm gonna say it again. Rules make a game enjoyable. Like, can you imagine watching a game with no rules? Come on, coach, you would be annoyed if you were watching a basketball game and suddenly we did away with the out of bounds lines, we took away the referees. It'd be like, this is madness. How do you even play the game? And the same is true in life. Without principles, uh, life becomes madness. And it's learning to create margin, to create space between our load and our limits. Because here's the thing. If you don't have any margin in your life, there's no room for God to surprise you. There's no room for God to do something that didn't meet your agenda. There's no room for God to bless you or to catch you off guard. You have no space in your life uh, for God to do something out of the ordinary because you've maxed yourself out and you've pushed him out of the scenario, which is what ego is. E-G-O, edging God out. And you, you edge him out because you think you know what's best and you don't give any space for him to say, but what if, and what if? And so you can't live spontaneous to the things of God. In addition to that, you then live with a parched soul because you're redlining it and you're fatigued and you're exhausted at all times. And here's the problem. Exhausted people exaggerate problems. Exhausted people exaggerate problems. So what happens is, is you go through life lacking fulfillment and because you're so fatigued, you then blow everything out of proportion. And, and scripture saying, yeah, don't do that. Develop some disciplines, develop some boundaries, have a day off. And I love the principle where he says, you should do all your work. And here's something that uh, I'm gonna try to, tread lightly and be gentle, but I, I do see this a lot with those entering the workforce. They're, they're new to a profession and they don't have a lot of career skills in place. I find that they develop bad habits and then they carry it out for the rest of their career. And a lot of individuals find themselves working around the clock because they don't work well on the clock. A lot of individuals don't work well on the clock and so they find themselves working around the clock. Because you decided to hang out in the break room and talk fantasy sports for an hour, now you're at the kitchen table answering emails instead of playing horse with your kid in the driveway. That's a miss. That, that, that's what scripture's saying. No, 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 you have to be so guarded. This is the priority. Like we, we tell our staffs, don't you dare sacrifice your family on the altar of your ministry. That's a miss. And what happens is, is we, we develop these really bad habits in our careers and it comes at the expense of all the things that matter most. Your marriage and your relationship with your children and your emotional, psychological, and spiritual well-being. And so it's just saying, okay, I need to be more disciplined I need to work better on the clock so I don't have to work around the clock. And you can always gauge a person's wisdom by looking at the pages of their calendar. Yes, time flies. But folks, you are the pilot. And so it's just learning to say, I need to manage my time better and I need to have a day uh, that I check out and replenish, right? And there comes a point in, in Matthew chapter 11 where Jesus is, he's so brilliant. Jesus would make his way throughout the region. He's uh, unveiling his ethic of love. He's establishing kingdom values. He's uh, you know, just ushering in you know, so many redemptive things. And what I love about Jesus is he didn't walk around with a sermon in his back pocket. Jesus did not develop sermons for people. Instead, Jesus derived sermons from people. 
What I mean by that is Jesus didn't show up and say, hey, I've been working on this lecture. Everybody sit down and listen. No, Jesus would show up and he would bump into somebody and he would make it personal before he made it professional and he would get to know them and then he would say, oh, I can speak to that. And he would derive a sermon from them. And so he's going throughout the region and he's teaching and there comes a point where he just can tell these people are weary and exhausted and burdened. And he makes this statement. He says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That what he's saying is, hey, rest isn't something you deliver. It's uh, something, I mean, rest is not something you develop. It's something I'm delivering. I will give you rest, right? He says, he goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what was the, the practical tip that we established on the front end of this message? Highlight the verbs. And what are the verbs in here? The first verb is come. Which again, I, I love this about Christ and I know we live in times where being a gentleman is not as popular anymore, which I think is nonsense. Uh, but I will say this. I love that our God is a gentleman. I love that he works by invitation, not invasion. I love that he doesn't show up in the middle of the night with a crowbar and leverage his way into our lives, but he gently and courteously and just patiently uh, awaits for you and I to engage with him. Hey, I'm standing ready, arms wide open, excited and willing to be in relationship with you. Would you come to me? And for some of you, if you're wondering, hey, where's my next step in this conversation? Chances are, it's you need to come to Christ. You need to engage in a relationship with Christ. You need to fully surrender your life to him, walk away from your Pharaoh, your Egypt, and enter into a life of freedom where he is the one true God over your life. It is coming to Christ and engaging that relationship. And then he says, come to me. And what's the next verb? Take. Take my yoke upon you. Which I remember uh, there was a time where I was doing this as a Bible study and someone objected. They're like, yep, yeah, see, there it is again. That sounds like slavery. A yoke, and this guy said, Pastor CJ, do you even understand what a yoke is? It is a collar that you put on a horse to pull a wagon. That sounds terrible. And I said, okay, you're right to some degree, uh, but here's where you have it wrong. Do you know what a yoke looked like in Jesus's day? He said, no. I said, well, maybe here's another question. How many horses was a yoke created for in Jesus's day? Two. And so what Jesus is saying is, hey, there's this yoke, two horses go in it. I already have it on my shoulders. Would you link up with me? Well, why does Christ want us to link up with him? So we can discover, hey, he does the heavy lifting. When you link up with Christ, here's what you're gonna learn. You're gonna learn how to do the small things like they are big things. And you're going to discover how God does the big things like they're small things. Someone say, run it back. When, when you link up with Christ, you learn to do the small things like they're big things. Hey, this matters to God. This is important. I need to steward this well. I need to develop these disciplines. I need to be faithful. I'm gonna do the small things like they're big things. And I'm gonna discover his unique, impeccable, unparalleled ability to do the big things, the miraculous things, the supernatural, earth-moving type of things as if they're small things. And what you find is when you take upon his yoke, uh, he, he does the heavy lifting. And that's a beautiful thing. And then what's the next verb? He says, come to me, take my yoke upon you, and learn, which I think is where we sometimes get exposed in our faith for being unrealistic. Yes, going to church is important. Yes, hearing a sermon adds value. Uh, but you have to be mindful that this is not some microwave pressure cooker uh, that just spits out fully spiritually righteous people every hour on a Sunday. That there's a learning curve to this. And I would say it this way, that faith may not improve things immediately. 
but a lack of faith will impair things gradually. That makes sense? And so sometimes it is, you're learning, you're, you're growing in stature and you are developing handles and mindsets and you're developing productive rhythms and disciplines. And as you learn, what's the byproduct? Jesus said, hey, come to me and I will give you rest. How are you gonna give me rest? I'm gonna do the heavy lifting and I'm going to teach you a new approach to life. And for starters, Learn to shut it down. Learn to take a day off. <clears throat> Learn to develop a rhythm that creates margin and space in your life. And this is where the thought of, of running comes to mind, is I, I don't like running. Anyone just wave at me if you're like, no, no thank you. And I've never been able to really understand people who like running. Kristen ran through college, did marathons, 5Ks, that whole thing. And I, that, that type of person confuses me. I will run if there's a base to get to or an end zone or a bucket to score. There has to be purpose as to why I'm just gonna run. But you're just gonna go outside and run five miles in one direction. And when you hit five miles, you're just gonna turn around and run back. And I had one guy come up, he says, you know why us runners enjoy running? He said, because there's such a great feeling every time you quit. I was like, well, that's a weird way of saying it. <laughs> Nonetheless, Scripture does say when it comes to our faith, it gives us the metaphor. It gives us the illustration that we are to run our race, right? Run the race marked out for you. Throw off all the things that easily entangle you, right? Run your race. And here's the problem. Most of us, when we think of running and we think of the race before us, we think it's a sprint. And it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. In fact, I would say it's a marathon with hurdles. <laughs> Anyone discover some hurdles in your trek? Yeah. And here's the beautiful distinction in that. If you go to a track meet and you watch a sprint, what's the goal? To be first. One person walks away a winner. Everybody else walks away a loser. The goal in a sprint is to be first. But if you've ever been to a marathon, what's the goal? To finish. Who cares about being first? In fact, if you stay around long enough, the best moment is at the very end. It's not seeing the person across the finish line first. It's staying there to the late hours and it's watching them tear down some of the equipment. And here comes somebody rounding the corner and the place erupts. And the most emotional moment at a marathon is when the last runner finishes the race and crosses the line. It's amazing. And folks, that's how we as a community of faith should think about life. If you think about it as a sprint, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna start competing with people alongside you in their spiritual journey, measuring up. Oh, what are, and it's all about a race. It's all about being first and it's nonsense and it's toxic within the church. But when you understand it as a marathon and say, hey, we're all in this together. We're all trying to figure it out. We're all trying to develop rhythms that can make us effective and sustainable for the long haul. And the goal here is let's just finish the race. And here's the thing, you're gonna have a hard time finishing well if you don't put some reins on your career. Do not sacrifice your marriage. Do not sacrifice your children. Do not sacrifice your emotional, psychological, spiritual well-being. Do not sacrifice your identity on the altar of your career. And you get down the road and you finish well and you finish without a parched soul and you finish with joy and delight within you. And I would say two principles in leaving. One, the first one's corny, only 11 of you will laugh at it, but it'll hopefully help you remember it. Resisting Jesus is resisting arrest. There you go. Some of you is gonna land on like Thursday. 
He's not trying to put you in cuffs, but he's saying, hey, come to me and I will give you rest. And resisting Jesus is resisting a supernatural rest for your souls. And lastly, your life, it moves to a better place when you move at a sustainable pace. Your life, it moves to a better place when you move at a sustainable pace. So let's finish well.